Good afternoon, everybody. It's Dr. Galvin with another COVID update. And today we're going to be talking about, as promised, school and COVID. And I want to thank everybody who took the time out to uh, put comments on the YouTube channel and on the Facebook uh, page. You know, people didn't just put a couple of words, they put huge paragraphs. And getting kids back to school is a huge, huge deal. And, you know, obviously it's a big, big, important issue for a lot of people. A lot of passion put into those responses and, and people are really, really concerned. I think the bottom line is that most people feel like kids need to be in school and at the same time, kids and families need to be safe. And some people are feeling safer with their kids out of school and some people feel that their kids are not getting what they need being out of school and, and their parents who have their kids who are in school and are very happy with that. And so I thought we would take a look and see, you know, what is the science show? I think if you guys remember a few weeks ago or maybe even a month ago, I said, you know, we would have some answers once school opened and had been open for a few weeks, we'd probably get a sense of whether this was going to be an unmitigated disaster or whether it was okay to send kids back to school or not. And so now we've had school open for anywhere for, for a few weeks, maybe even a month. And, and we're getting a little sense of what's going on. And there's a few data sources I've looked at. The first thing I'm gonna look at is a, it's not really a study, but it's a survey out of Brown University. Um, an economics professor there has done a survey of 570 schools, 300 of which are doing in-person classes. Now it's a voluntary service a survey, so it's not purely scientific, but right now what they're showing is in those schools, 0.22% of students and 0.51% of teachers are either positive for COVID or have suspected COVID symptoms. So a pretty low number of cases. There's a website and I'm gonna to link to it at the bottom of the video. Um, and it shows you know, where they're getting that data from. And it looks like 20% of those schools right now, of 568 schools responding, are at full, part, full capacity in person. 43% are in some kind of hybrid uh, capacity. 37% um, are remote only, and 1% are just not in session at all. And almost all of the ones who are in session are doing pretty, you know, pretty stringent um, mitigation things, masking, distancing, all those things. There was also some tech, um, data that was released from the state of Texas which has 1.1 million students that are doing in-person learning. And so far they've got a 0.31% infection rate among students. Um, so those are like kind of uh, lower grade students and adolescents, so that's pretty good. And they've had 2,850 positive employees out of about 800,000 employees in the school system. Now Texas does not say how many of those 800,000 um, employees are actually working within the schools, just like in the schools themselves. So I, I don't, it's a little harder to figure out what their employee data looks like. And then Science Magazine did an interesting analysis. And again, all these are, are linked at the bottom here that found that children and adolescents are at a much lower risk um, than assumed um, uh, of, of both getting the virus and transmitting. And the assumption that school children would be a key component of transmission of the virus is likely false. So it looks like, at least preliminarily, that the assumption that the that ch kids are going to be a big transmission of virus is probably not true, especially like we talked about younger kids. And we've talked about how they're less susceptible, less um, of the ACE2 receptors, lower you know, respiratory quotient, less respiratory exchange, probably less ability to transmit the virus lower susceptibility, lower ability to transmit, especially in those younger kids. And, and so all that seems to be playing out preliminarily. Now, that's the good news. Now, the bad news is that we know that those numbers change as, as ages go up. And, you know, about 20% of active COVID cases are coming from folks who are in their 20s. And so we're seeing these spikes in college campuses. We're seeing big spikes in cases in college towns. And also we're starting to see as winter comes and people are going inside, big spikes in cases. And we're seeing increasing numbers of cases as we go and rising numbers. And so we have to take that into account. And you know what does that mean for high school students? I don't know if we really know 
you know, the answer for, for high school and college students. I certainly think that younger students, uh, I, I think we can confidently say, at least preliminarily, that those kids are, are pretty safe if we take appropriate precautions. And I do think that high school students and college age students can safely um, go, go to school as well, as long as we're taking careful precautions. Now, in terms of families, as I've said before, we've got to look at our family and look at our risks because you know, I think that that wedding in Maine is a pretty good example. You know, that there was that wedding in Maine, and I think there's been 177 cases that have been tracked to that wedding in seven deaths. None of the deaths came from the wedding. They were, they were you know, subsequent exposure. So someone went to the wedding, exposed somebody else who exposed somebody else who subsequently exposed somebody who died. And so I think when we're looking at our own, you know, our own decisions about whether or not to send our kids to school, I think that decision has to rest at our own comfort level. If we're in a situation where we have no one at, at home who has any health risks, if we were healthy, we're, you know, we don't have grandma living with us, we don't have somebody who's immunocompromised, we feel like we're, we're in a pretty safe situation, sending our younger kids to school is, and, and the school has got reasonable precautions in place, I think it's, it's, it's gonna be pretty safe. If you've got somebody who's got an underlying medical problem, immunocompromised, someone who's living with you who's older, then you've got to make the decision, maybe I need to, to let my kids go remotely. Um, and, and you've got to, you know, that individual has, that individual family has to make those decisions for themselves. What are best practices? Well, you know, Jennifer from Iowa put a real, you know, talked about how their state is doing it. And, you know, what their state is doing is that they've, they've laid down what the criteria are. We're going to leave our schools open. And I think, if the rolling, I think the 10 day average is, is less than 15% positivity, the schools are gonna stay open. And, and um, if you look at, I think she posted on Facebook what the actual criteria are, but the nice thing about that is that it's very transparent. They're pub, Iowa's publishing the numbers and everybody knows what the numbers are, so there's no surprise. As long as those numbers are below a certain level, schools are gonna stay open. If it goes above that, everybody knows what's going to happen, and so, you know, there's not a lot of, of, of gray area there. Everybody kind of knows what's going on and everybody's kind of on the same page. I think that everybody needs to have a safety outlet where if they don't feel comfortable or they, they feel that they're a special risk, then they need to have the ability to keeping their kids out and going remotely. But if you feel that it's safe, I really think the kids are, uh, need to be given the opportunity to go. Now, We've talked about this risk of, of a second spike as, as winter comes, and, and, we've, and I'll come back to that, I think, in future videos, why we think that the fall is going to bring more cases and, and, and more outbreaks because of A, the nature of viruses, the nature of cold weather and people coming back inside, the nature of COVID fatigue and people taking less, less precaution. And I think it's probably inevitable that we're gonna see increases in cases, increases in deaths as the fall and winter approach. And that may change our calculus and it may change the numbers as we go forward. But, you know, I think the bottom line is that the preliminary numbers from the places that kids have gone back in person are encouraging. And I think that as parents, you can be reassured. And, you know, luckily we're not seeing kids get particularly ill and it does not look like kids are making other people particularly ill. So again, thank you very much for your input. Um, if you have more comments, put it below. I'll be back next week with more COVID stuff. We do have a hormone thing coming up tomorrow. Um, as usual, if you find this useful, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook. My name is Jeffrey Galvin. I'm an emergency doctor that's been kind of following what's been going on with COVID since the beginning. As usual, wear your mask, wash your hands, look out for yourselves, look out for your families, look out for those around you. Stay safe. We'll get through this. I'll see you soon.